So this is uh, our session about the brain imaging data structure. And uh, presenting is uh, Christy Whitaker uh, here with us from uh, the UK, where she is at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, Christy, among the many other things that she does, is also a member of the steering committee of BIDS. And she'll, she'll probably tell you about the structure of the project, sort of the, the socio-technical aspect of the, the project. And, um, and that includes the, the steering committee and sort of how that all works. And I'll um, hand it over to her. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so folks, I have put um, a link in the Slack channel, which uh, is, and I might just be able, I wonder if actually someone could put it maybe in the q and A. I I think I can't add anything to the q and A. but if you put it in the q and A, if someone could volunteer to do that, then at least uh, people might be able to grab that from there. And what a HackMD is, is it's just a collaborative document. There are 73 of you here, so we might crash it, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, let me change this to everyone. And uh, what I hope is that you will be able to head to that link. I'll just stop one. There's just a couple of you here. Yeah. And um, what you're looking at is a markdown file. Many of you will have already seen this if you've used GitHub and things like that. Markdown is embedded. You can split it into two, where you can have um, you can see the raw markdown and the rendered text on the right. And yeah, if you don't mind, it'd be really great if you could put your names on one of the lines here. It's gonna be like a fun and exciting uh, clash because you'll all start trying to write on <laughs> the same line, obviously. Um, but just while you're doing this, whilst you're navigating to the link and whilst you're um, adding your name in there, let me, I suppose, tell you sort of why I'm asking you to to work in this hack md and i'll just i'll stop sharing for just a second just so you can um you can see me maybe and add your names so i am really interested in open research open source software reproducibility and what is fundamental for me to all of those things is an understanding of of why we would want to collaborate with each other. And there are lots of different reasons. I think lots of things about Neuro Academy, for example, is that it's really fun. Like it's exciting to be able to learn new things, learn from other people, um, develop new skills, find out ways to do things differently. It's really, it's really enjoyable. But sort of more fundamental to the fun aspect is I think it's a a moral imperative that we don't waste taxpayer or donor, for example, money in reinventing the wheel and wasting our time um, doing tasks that other people have done, but that we individually or within our, our particular research group don't know how to do. And one of my personal experiences was learning how to do MRI analyses when I was a PhD student at UC Berkeley. And sitting at my desk, uh, I was very interested in using uh, FSL back then and other folks in the lab used SPM. And so I was kind of alone figuring out how to do things. And I knew that there were other people in the exact same building, not necessarily in my research group, but in the same building, you had already struggled through all of the problems that I had gone through. And yet here I was continuing to struggle. And there's this sort of deep um, reflection that we could all have around the purpose of the struggle. Like maybe it's supposed to be hard in order to like really learn something, but maybe also it's not supposed to be that hard, right? Maybe there are hard aspects of doing brain imaging research, which is, I don't know, like thinking about the mind and how the mind might relate to the body and how that engages in our thoughts and experiences. That's hard, right? That's really hard stuff. That's science. Um, 
manipulating the data, moving it around, figuring out how to ask statistical questions from some of these more philosophical questions that we might have. Also really hard, really interesting problem. Moving data from one computer to another computer, reading in the files, being able to count how many subjects we have across a few different data sets, in my opinion, is not something that should be that hard. And yet, it's how we spend an awful lot of our time. So I'm really interested in trying to think about how we can all together um, make the way in which we do science more, I think, ethical and certainly responsible and, and faster, basically, get us to really important insights quicker. So let me, uh, let me just check the Q&A and we've got that. That's great. Thank you so much for the links. And I will share my screen again to come back to this HackMD and uh, refresh the page. And I can see lots of, lots of ones here. And I wonder if I could ask you, thank you so much for all of your names. If you could fill in, yes, you've already got a bunch of them going. So yes, please have a look down and start to fill in and add a bullet point. You could add a little uh, plus one. So uh, I think this one is a pretty good one. So I'm going to add a little emoji plus one next to it. And if you want, you can add extra emojis or plus ones next to the ones that you agree with. We don't, you don't have to rewrite them. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to read some of these as you add them. And don't worry too, too much about all of the various um, exciting sort of formatting that you get going on when you all collaborate on one document at the same time. So I'm liking a lot of these answers. <laughs> we've got, uh, we're going to save some money, openness, although I would ask you to like think about what you mean by openness, uh, transparency, accessibility, reproducibility. I think they all fit sort of under a, a, a larger umbrella of openness for sure. Increased sample sizes is a really, really good one. Um, I don't know if anyone's written sort of generalizability, maybe the meta-analysis is starting to get at that. Like, can you can you take a finding from one particular data set and, and sort of does it become more powerful if you understand it across different data sets from maybe um, people from different countries, different cultures, uh, different age groups, people in different patient groups, things like that. Um, you can definitely develop new software and uh, you can, yeah, you can sort of, I just agree, I agree with all of these. And I like the, the training and learning as well. It's much, much easier to do that. So let me scroll down and just see what folks are saying and please do also scroll as well to tell me what's hard about sharing brain imaging data. So it's big, that's true. The organization, like it, it, that's a really good point as well. Um, the software to share it, I think probably what the software one is talking about is that like it's sort of the how, like how do you share it is, um, is not super easy. Although uh, Data Lad is a really good a uh, tool which you might have heard of already that is specifically built to help uh, share it, share with versions. Um, <laughs> this is like an interesting meta bullet point that the hard thing about sharing brain imaging data is bids uh, in a talk about bids for sharing brain imaging data. So I hope that one of my goals is to make that maybe not <laughs> too much of a problem, but we'll have time for questions. Um, Knowledge of how to do so. This is, this is, to be honest, and maybe this was sort of part of the bids one. Like, it's, it's how do you do it is pretty hard. I agree with that. And I, I hope that I'm here to leave you with some bullet points to, and some, some links to be able to help you on that front. Um, I don't know how to get rid of my yellow comment. It's there forever now. Oh, well, I like it. Um, Long grant durations and use of data in the lab, that is getting at my like big, big pet peeve, which is that we are actually disincentivized 
from sharing brain imaging data. Because although I believe that it's a moral imperative to share the data because I think that taxpayers or donors are paying for the, the collection of that data and the people who have given it have given their consent for its use um, in research purposes, the incentives within academia basically mean that it is, uh, why would anyone bother to share your data when you want to be the unique, the novel, the, the special group of people or individual that has access to that data. I will not stand on my soapbox too much longer on that point, but you should definitely ask me questions if you want to know more of my opinions on that point. Vision control is hard, for sure, yep. Uh, you know, you've got data coming in at different times and you want to be able to kind of know when you took a particular, when you did a particular analysis. Uh, convincing PIs to share openly, I think that relates to that long grant durations and those incentives points. And the IRB requirements is a huge, huge um, point there and I completely agree with it. And that's something that I do within my role at the Turing Institute to try and sort of, I'm the chair of the ethics advisory group there. And one of the things that I advocate for <laughs> is reorganizing the ways in which we consider data to be ethically shared, such that closing the data, making sure that it's deleted, for example, I think is unethical, but you do have to do a lot of patient and public engagement so that people understand what's happening with their data and for what purpose. Uh, same with PHI there. Um, yeah, I think this is a really, really good one. How is the data collected? What was the task? Like, there's actually a lot of metadata that needs to go along with the individual data. And the metadata is um, really the sort of, that's, that's some of the, the magic of bids. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about metadata in just a second. Um, and that is the same, that is sort of the same point here of missing knowledge from previous researchers who've left the institution. That's the, that's the sort of, wouldn't it be great to just be inside of the brain of that postdoc who went to Google? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the bus factor in open source projects. The bus factor is uh, how many people in your project would need to be hit by a bus, unfortunately, in order for the project to uh, stumble and, and have major problems. And so you want to have a high bus factor. You want to have many people in your project that would have to be um, incapacitated in order for your project to, to really stumble. And in many cases, I think that's not true. I think in many cases, there's really a bus factor of, of one. One key person knows all of the information. And in our particular case, we're thinking about like where it's saved on the server or the password to that file. Um, or as we've, have you said in there, the specific, you know, the names on the columns and what they mean. Uh, there are differences across scanners. That's absolutely true. There's different data formats. That's absolutely true. Um, these all make it really hard. Uh, I also am really, and this, I'm really into this vulnerability to criticism or perfectionism. So one of the things that you might not want to share your data because you want to be competitive with others and have like a leg up and go better than them. You also might not want to share your data because it's pretty likely that you've got like problems or errors in your data and you might not have seen them. And we live in a world at the moment where it is disincentivized to acknowledge that you've made a mistake. And so I think that's absolutely right that there is a vulnerability to criticism, but I, I, this is something that's like my change that I would like to see in the world is, is removing that perfectionism and recognizing a community effort can go further, faster, but you have to have a high amount of trust and uh, safety inside of your collaboration to allow that to happen. So thank you all so much for all of those answers. I really appreciate it. Uh, down at the bottom, there is a section here that are on my questions. And then there's a little, there's a little one here on your questions. So either add them to the Q&A. If you add them to the q and I'll be able to see them and I can stop and go through. Or if you think that they're good to put at the end, you can just add them down at the bottom of that hack and and scroll down. Let me switch to some of the points that I wanted to cover. Oh, I'll tell you what, actually, let me just take a moment and show you. Um, let's see if I can find Panda Data Sharing YouTube. Okay, so this, if anyone has, I, probably all of you have seen it. I'm not going to play it now, but it is so freaking amazing. It is a video about people trying to um, share their... Um, 
it's about, sorry, you type at the same time. It's, about, it's a story of um, the data set, and it's incredibly, it's a, it's a really funny video, but it's also very painful if you've ever tried to actually share data before or get access to somebody else's data. So check that out in your spare time. The FAIR principles, I can't see you on a voting, so it's difficult for me to know if you already know everything about the FAIR principles, so I'm very, very sorry if you, if you already do. The, the FAIR, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And they are principles around the metadata of uh, data sets. So those, um, those terms that allow you to explain kind of everything about the data with the data itself being the, the individual values. Um, I am personally super, super interested in the interoperability aspect. So the thing that I care an awful lot about with the FAIR principles is being able to combine data sets together. And I just want to very quickly navigate to hub.neuroacademy. Go to my server. And yeah, okay, here we go. And you'll all be able to see this, I think, as well. But inside of data, there's a few different data sets that you've got here. And if we go to Conte 69, there's some um, gifty files in there. There's a README as well. So we've got a little bit of information about uh, thanks to the Van Essen lab who've come up with this atlas. Then we've got a free surfer home. We've got some information about free surfer. We've got a MISC folder. Well, there's nothing in there. That's okay. We've got a NI preps folder with some files in here. We've got, um, let me move you over. We've got some nifty files here. We've got a JSON file. We've got some H5 files. And we've got some various different um, files in there. And if I go to the EEG, we've also got some different files. We've got a, whoops, I didn't mean to double click on that. We've got a, a .fif file, a .txt file that goes with it. My point with this is that if we wrote a script and we wanted to run it across all of these different data sets, we couldn't, right? You wouldn't be able to because each of these different data sets are slightly idiosyncratic. And they all make sense in the context that the individual uh, tutorials or demonstrations are created for. They completely make sense to the individuals who um, created the data sets. But if we wanted to have a generalized framework like a, a program that was able to go into a folder and tell us a whole bunch of information about the data set, we would not be able to do that um, from inside of here. There's a couple that are, this one in particular is the one that I'm going to show you, that are in bids format. And here, they, it is more standardized. You would be able to go into a folder with a data set name and see the different folders and they'll have the same structure. So that's, what I, that's my point with this. And this is the interoperability aspect of making sure that um, files and directory structures are machine readable as well as human readable. I'm going to flip back because I just wanted to sort of heavily emphasize this point about interoperable. I'm also interested in accessible, whether the data can actually be accessed. <laughs> if, it can't, if it needs to be secure, but it can't be accessed, then that's not very good. And if it exists, but no one can find it, then that's not very good either. And the reusable aspect is actually giving people the permission to reuse it. And that relates both to the individuals who collected the data but also very importantly, the individuals who are represented inside of data sets of human subjects, making sure that they have given consent for the data to be reused. So I also want to very quickly just shout out, I'll add it to the HackMD now, um, open consent, I think is this one. Oh, no, I've got it wrong, hang on. Um, oh, 
open brain consent, that's what I needed. Um, and Open Brain Consent is a really fantastic community project from, uh, you, many of you will know and maybe contribute to this project. And it's coming up with uh, <laughs> the ultimate consent form. So a recommended consent form that is very clear about describing uh, what is going to be done with the data and why it is important to make it um, publicly available and not destroy it afterwards. So let me just uh, come back to this page. And I will add it to the attendee. Just those for folks who are looking to try and make it easier to share your data uh, at your own institution. So, BIDS to the rescue. BIDS is the brain imaging data structure. And it is a, um, well, here, yeah, actually, I decided I was going to. Click on here. <laughs> this website, by the way, is um, not the most beautiful website in the world. If anyone is looking for ways in which they could help, it would be totally cool if you wanted to help improve our website. Um, neuroimaging experiments result in complicated data, and so far there's no consensus on how to organize and share the data. And the lack of con consensus can lead to misunderstandings and time wasted. And so what we're describing here is a simple and easy to adopt way of organizing neuroimaging and behavioral files to go with it. So these are DICOM files that come off of an MRI scanner. And this is the beautiful um, directory structure that they can be mapped into so that you are very easy and interoperably able to find those files. Um, and the, the, um, the specification is the standard is what tells you how you can um, access each of the, how you, how you understand what sub 01 task type and resc bold nifty uh, gz means. We can click on specification to get to that, go to browse online. And here is the bid specification. Um, it starts out pretty friendly, it's okay. And we can click on bid specification, we can go to the introduction. And we've got some motivation here. This is all very, very similar to what we've already sort of self-generated in the HackMD. You can extend it and you can cite it. In fact, you should cite it. So that's good. This is all okay. There's some common principles. And now we're kind of getting into like, whoa, must, must not, required, shall, shall not, getting a bit intense. And we're getting into sort of very specific definitions of data set, subject, session data acquisition, data type, task. So we're getting a bit much. Things can be compulsory, optional, and additional. The file name structure that has uh, chains of entities, a suffix and an extension. And there's a really interesting and sort of deep problem between source and raw and derived data. And I just want to sort of highlight to you that I am sort of glazing over reading this page. And I, I want to map to you, because I've been in the BIDS community for a while, that everyone, everyone is glazing over reading this, this page. This page are the facts. This is the cold, hard truth of what it means to have a standard. We have to have something that we can sort of touch on. We can't keep having like nice, squishy human differences in the way that we store these files, because that is what is breaking our interoperability in general. But wowzers trousers, this is a big file, right? There's an inheritance principle. We're getting taxed on these things. It's a lot. And my point with this is I would really love for all of you to know that the specification exists, to know that you can search the specification. So I'm going to search for um, field map. Field map data. So I can go and have a look at uh, an example of a field map data set in here. And I can go and read some of the specific examples and I can get my exact definitions. But I really want to emphasize that it's hard and specifications need to be dry. They need to be very, very sort of specific. They're kind of they're not legal documents, but they need to be like as binding as legal documents because where people can interpret a sentence differently they will interpret a sentence differently and that breaks our interoperability but the 
the power of the brain imaging data structure only manifests if people use <laughs> the brain imaging data structure, right? If it's just one data set that's following its own standard, it doesn't work. We can't combine things together. So let me come back to my links here. Uh, a couple of years ago, Patrick Park, who is a Google Summer of Code student, and I, but with great help from Dora Hermes, uh, Remy Gao, Chris Holgraf, and Elizabeth Dupree, have started to create a bid starter kit. And this is the main thing that I want you to sort of know about, because I'm sure many of you know about bids, and many of you have seen that specification. In fact, many of you may have gone, uh, and not been very interested in reading the specification much more but maybe you haven't seen the bid starter kit. So for example, in the bid starter kit, this is actually one figure, but it doesn't fit very well. You gotta scroll. Um, we've got a nice image that, that looks through the, the folder hierarchy. Um, and I've also got an image here of what a JSON file looks like. And I wanna just dig into two of those things because I think understanding the purpose of the folder hierarchy is really, really helpful for understanding bids and understanding what a JSON file was, is, was a huge barrier for me joining the BIDS community. I was like, JSON, JSON, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on with it. Ugh. And then I went back to like my million other tasks that I needed to do. So now that I do know what a JSON file is, I want to like send that information over to you. So let me click on the BIDS starter kit. Um, and this is the bid starter kit. It's kind of zoomed in on my page because I want you to be able to see the screen okay. Uh, it's a GitHub repository. So it's owned by bid standard. It's a bid starter kit here. And it's got some folders in here. It's got some files. It's also got a readme file. And the readme file talks us through, it says that the brain imaging data structure is a community curated collection of tutorials, wikis, and templates to get you started with creating bids compliant data sets. And there's a bit of motivation, there's a bit of project summary, I've told you this already. And how do I find information? And we, it's in the wiki. Click on the wiki here. This is very hard to find, and I will not go on a huge rant about how much I dislike GitHub wikis, but I do dislike GitHub wikis, but I lost this fight in summer of 2018. And so the bid starter kit is currently housed in the GitHub wiki. The GitHub wiki, um, has a home page. It just says welcome, like come on down. And you can find various other pages on the right hand side here. So I want to go quickly to the frequently asked questions, which I think is very hard. I was talking to someone yesterday and they said it was very hard to find the frequently asked questions. I would also say that because the frequently asked questions are very hard to find, they're not actually very frequently <laughs> asked and they don't always cover all of the different points that they could. I and Patrick, Patrick and I added this, what is a JSON file one? I'm gonna click on it in just a second and show you. And we've got some various different points about general questions. Um, we've got uh, one in here about anonymizing the structural image of my data set. We've got some EEG ones um, and a couple of others around phenotypes or um, different data sets to go with. So the JSON file is gonna be in the metadata file formats tab. And a JSON file is a text file that takes the following structure. It has a key and a value, and then another key and another value. And it's like a dictionary that we're able to kind of call so we can ask of the JSON file to return to us the values associated with a particular key. And they can be nested. So actually key three calls another value pair um, and there are some various different tools here that allow you to read and write JSON either online, uh, tools in MATLAB or Octave, it tells you how to read in a JSON file, write out a JSON file, there's some tools in Python and tools in R and those, those are, these are they and I just want to pull back, this is the specific one that is one of the data description.json files where the data set has a name, it has a bids version, it has a license, it has some authors. This is a made up one. So Paul Broker and Carl Winning, he did not in fact work on this data set, but uh, we could imagine that they did. 
There's some acknowledgements, a how to acknowledge funding, references and links, and a data set DOI. So if every folder in the, a bids compliant data set has a data set description.json file, then these keys, which are shown in brown, but based on the editor that I took a screenshot from, the keys are all going to be the same across lots of different data sets, but the values are going to be different. And that's what allows us to both kind of human read this file. I can read this file and read the acknowledgements, but I can also machine read this file in order to get the information that I need. Uh, the TSV file uh, is, sorry, the TSV file is like a comma separated file, but without commas, it uses a tab instead. And the TSV file is really useful for um, getting all of the behavioral information that needs to go along with your scans. So if I flip to my Jupyter Hub, I can show you my data set description file. So that's my, we've got a name, a license, we've got some authors in here, we've got some references and links. And in the participants.tsv file, we have just a couple of columns here. Um, we've got participant IDs and then dominant hand. And that's obviously useful for the, for the project. In fact, I could find out from the project why it was useful. It's useful because it's a test retest fMRI data set for motor language and spatial attention functions. So the last thing that I want to show you, and then I'm going to answer a couple of questions is um sorry is in in the bids folder hierarchy i showed you that picture before you have at the top a project inside of the project are lots of subjects inside of the subjects so the individual participants are your sessions so that might be the time points at which people come and inside of the session, you have a particular type of data. So uh, I'm just going to use the example, I think, here. So inside of our, so this is Open Euro is sort of the owner of this folder. DS114 is the name of the data set. It's obviously a very exciting name. We have some subjects in here. We have subject, and again, they are creatively named 01, 02, 03, 04. They don't need to be named that way. They can be named anything, but you do have to have sub hyphen at the beginning. Inside of each of all of these subjects, I'll show you seven and four. You have two folders. They are your sessions. So this was a SES session hyphen test, and then there was one called retest. And those are the same across all of the different subjects. So we can machine readable go in and get all each of those, regardless of the specific subject we're looking at. Inside of the test, there are three different modalities. There's the anatomy folder, there's the diffusion weighted imaging folder, and there's a functional folder. That's just separating out the different modalities to make it a little bit easier for them to be um, accessed. So in the anatomy folder, it's dead simple. We have a T1 weighted here. Interestingly, the file name repeats some of the information. So we know that this file is subject 05 because we know it's in the folder of subject 05. But this was a design decision that was made by BIDS quite early on to try and make the file itself uh, sort of understandable when you were just looking at it. So it's, it's the subject, we know that it's in the test session, and the suffix here is telling you that it's a T1 weighted image, it's just regular structural image. In the functional folder, we have subject 05, the session test, we have a task, and the task that they happen to be doing is called covert verb generation. And the type of scan, this is a nifty file, but the type of scan is a bold sequence. And the task is covert verb generation. There's another task that they did called fingers, foot, and lips, feet and lips. There's a line dissection task. There's an overt verb generation and overt word repetition. So these are all different tasks along here. Uh, and the line dissection one is an event related fMRI task. And so in that, file, in that uh, TSV file, we can have uh, the time of the onset of a stimulus of a particular um, what was the name of this? This was a 
line bisection. So presumably they saw a line and had to bisect it at 24 seconds in, 25 seconds in, 27 seconds in. Each of these lasted for one second. They were weighted as one. And this is telling you the trial type. So this is the behavioral information that you need in order to analyze that event related um, file. And just for completeness, let me show you the diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, this, I think, is not complete because it should have, I think, a BVAL and a BVEC um, JSON file associated or just text file associated with it. In fact, we could look up in the specification. In the specification, DWI. Diffusion weighted imaging. So, what the diffusion weighted imaging should have is a file that has a subject with a label, maybe a session. These square brackets mean it's optional. Maybe an acquisition, which tells you if you've got different parameters. Um, maybe a direction that's optional, you don't necessarily need to. Maybe a run. So, you might do the same task four times over, and then you would have underscore run hyphen one, underscore run hyphen two, underscore run hyphen three. Um, and then you also need to have, like I was saying, a .bval and a .bvec file, and then potentially also this .json file that tells you a bit more information about the acquisition. And that's okay, that data set that we were using obviously hasn't been used for the purpose of analyzing diffusion weighted imaging, but it does. it is missing a couple of files in order to make it take people to complain. I knew that once I started talking, I would have tons and tons to say. And I think I want to finish and get to a couple of questions by reflecting on this, this um, cartoon. If you ever go to you know, an open science uh, conference that is focused on data sharing, I would say this cartoon gets shown, I don't know, one in every three talks. You see it over and over again. And I think it's an important cartoon to recognize because there is a huge arrogance in saying that this thing that has not been done before by these 14 people or groups before me, why would I believe that I or my team are now able to come up with the one universal standard? So I think there's an important reflection on maybe some of our like hubris about trying to create something that works for everything. Ask me about generalizable AI, for example. Um, but I also want to highlight that it is really important to have a standard that does work for the use cases in, in particular. And brain imaging, neuroimaging, imaging, medical imaging in general may in fact need multiple standards because the people who use that data are using it for a different purpose and they need different aspects from the, from the data. BIDS is really driven to be as simple and accessible to use as possible. And that does mean that there are limitations that are put on um, how we're using and developing the standard. But I think, I think we, we can make those difficult decisions as we go. I also want to put in here a town hall meeting at OHBM in the slides. They're really talking about the sort of future of bids and a lot of the current extensions, making sure that it works for everybody. Um, and I want to finish thanking, very specifically thanking the BIDS maintainers. So Franklin, Chris, um, Stefan, and maybe somebody else who wants to come and join us. These are like three white guys here. What if we didn't have three white guys who are leading it? What if there was like five and a bunch of people who also cared about um, bringing in more and more people so we didn't overwork these three folks? Just stay in. Um, I know that they are all working really hard on that as well. That is not a specific job at any of those individuals. And watch this. I'm going to scroll the contributors page inside of the specification to show you all of the different people that have contributed so far and the emojis next to all of the very many different ways in which they have contributed. So you, I would love for you to consider as a result of being here in this talk, being at Neuro Academy, how... you can help the BIDS community. Um, I'm a member of the steering group. We are here to listen. Uh, there is a blog post here that allows you to learn a little bit more about the five of us. 
Uh, we are pretty new in a sense. We're sort of nine months in. COVID has slightly knocked certainly my um, engagement, but we are really trying to think about making sure that the community grows and the community um, is serving the users as best we can, not out of a pure altruism, but out of reflecting on the fact that if we don't in fact use bids uh, around the world, then all of that interoperability is wasted. Okay, Ariel's appeared. That means I should start. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna appear here to say that there's a question already in the Q&A saying, how does this organization accommodate first level versus high level analyses? For example, you have multiple first level models for each participant run, and then you run a high level to incorporate a participant's run into one nifty like FSL, so you know, group level versus first level and so on. So, um, bids, as I've shown you so far, are the, is, the, is the raw data. Now, it's not the source data. The source data is what you get off of the scanner. The raw data are the sort of nifty files as they exist once you've converted them into nifty files. If you want to analyze that data, you are creating a derivative. And so now you have derivatives from that data. And if I wiggle over to the specification, um, I know Tal, who I think is not in this call because he's like hosting the other one right now. Is that right, Ariel? Yeah. So That's Tal right. and many of the other folks who are here uh, um, really led on this. So I'd really encourage you to, to chat with Tal. And it was a huge multi-year project to get this extension to the brain imaging data structure incorporated. But bids derivatives are your folders for when you've done something with the data. So this is your place to have a look at um, what a derived data set looks like. Uh, but let me very quickly also flip to data, open neuro here. Do you see at the same level as the subjects, which are the raw data, we also have a folder called derivatives. And the derivatives here have been run on fMRI prep. And that's because Oscar for the fMRI prep session ran this data set through fMRI prep producing these derivatives. And so inside of the derivatives, you now have the individual subjects, you have their session again, you have their functional images, and now you have all of the different, let me scooch this over, all of their various different um, output files that you would imagine. So what you would see, so to very specifically answer the question, is that you would see um, inside of derivatives, you would have multiple folders here with different uh, settings, and then you would be able to have those different parameters that you had used for the different high-level models. Um, in future, could scanners produce data in bids as standard? How far away is this? That is a great question, and... Um, it's from Scanner. Um, it is like a difficult name, right? Um, there is a project that does this. I'm blanking on the name right now. So I might have to put it, I might have to put it in this. Chris, Chris jumped in to mention something oh, about this. Thanks. Repro in project? Um, yes. Yeah. But this doesn't, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I'm thinking of it. I think I'm thinking of another one, but that there are a couple of there are a there couple is. of projects that do this. So yes, so Repro in from the Repro NIM, Repro Reproducible Neuroimaging Project. Thanks, Chris. Um, does this, and the hard part is getting the folks at your scanning and at your scanner to sort of feel confident um, using this because they'll already have a system that works for them. So you got to like try and get them on board with uh, using this and, and then spitting out all of the data in that way. But, but yes, it absolutely can exist. The hard part is getting the buy-in from, the, from those, um, the folks who kind of control that process. So maybe with that, uh, another question here is, as you mentioned, there are many standards. I have huge loyalty to bids, but find myself talking only out of experience to try and convince others to use it. What's, what's your elevator pitch? Bids for L. So how do you how do you convince your um, you know, your scanner physicists to do this? I feel like 
I feel like most of my time I'm telling all of the bids people internally that they need to make goods more accessible because I think it's kind of really difficult to use at the moment, which is obviously what I said through the whole way through. And I take responsibility for that. That is, I'm a member of the steering group. This is like where all the complaints should, should come. Um, I think, I think the elevator pitch is hard. I think if you are pitching to share data, well, no, okay. I think the only pitch that I, I personally can sort of stand behind is that you as an individual will benefit from so much of the rest of the bids ecosystem if you put your data into bids format right at the very beginning. So I think um, trying to take what you have already done or what somebody else in your research group has already done and turn it into bids format is really hard. And you might feel super motivated to do it, but you, but it, but it's, it's difficult. It's a lot of time. If however, you just start from the very beginning. So that, so if you sort of Say, well, this project I'm doing over here, fine, but my next project I'm going to put into bids format. And you start from the very beginning, you can really benefit from an awful lot. So I want to just shout out um, PyBids, which I think I have open in one of here. This is a project that, again, Tal was leading on or is, is leading on. And there is a really nice um, a tutorial under Binder in here. And PyBids gives you lots and lots of little tools to be able to read in all of this information. And so you get a lot for free by using other people's code if you have your data in bid standard. Um, so I think that's the pitch. I think there's also a pitch around, it is starting to be the case that if others use your data set, you can get some prestige from it. And I think there's also kind of like a network that you can build from putting your data out there and making it interoperable with other studies. And then finally, I think the biggest pitch that I would probably pull if I was an early career researcher would be able to say, um, I can't write the code for a network analysis or for um, an Oracle CCA, but I can understand it and the code is already available over there if I put the data into bids format, I'll be able to run these analyses more effectively. So I think those are the sort of directions that I would, that I would generally try and. Yeah, I'd say in that respect, fMRI prep is one of the, because not many people can make a lot of, you know, career points out of writing pre-processing code yeah. for fMRIs and everyone needs to pre-process fMRI data that they collect. And so if your data is organized as bids, it's, it's very, you push it through fMRI prep and you're done. And so that, that for me, I think is a really strong selling point for bids if you're trying to so pitch it to somebody yeah. in your organization, your PI or something. So yeah, okay, I'm so sorry. I knew I was gonna go over time. There's a, there are two answers to my question of how can you help the bids community of learn, use, which I like very much. I might take a screen grab of learn and use. I think they're great answers. And um, my ask to everyone, is that you you advocate as best you can and anything that you any problem that you have overcome with bids please edit the wiki you literally just click the little pen button and you can change there's a there's a type there are typos in there there's missing information and the more that everyone comes along and is able to make those changes and make it easier for people in the future the, the easier it is for everyone else so I think I'm pleading on your sort of your good nature rather than your um, selfish sides to come along and help us and we will move forwards together a little bit. Okay, I will stop you there so that we have a little pause before the next session. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Thanks everyone. And let's continue this discussion on Slack, Neurostars, et cetera. <laughs>